Welcome to note set number 34, where we'll uh, talk about characteristics of common analog filters. This is covered in section 10.34, 10.35 of Proacus and Monolacus. Um, and so what we're going to look at here, since we just saw about the bilinear transform, being able to transform uh, well-known analog filter designs into uh, nice uh, discrete time IIR filters <coughs> excuse me um, we should take a look at what are some of the common analog filters that have been designed that uh, we can draw from and no surprise it turns out that MATLAB already has a lot of these this functionality built right in um, but you know, it's important to uh, have an understanding of what underlies these MATLAB commands, otherwise you are ending up using a tool without really knowing how it works, and that can be very dangerous. So here's our motivation. Um, so as, I've, our, as I just said, uh, we just got done talking about the bilinear transform. Uh, and it gives us a way of taking these analog filter designs and transforming them into some nice discrete time IIR filters. <coughs> and, uh, you know, this idea came about because when people started looking at uh, digital signal processing, analog filter design had been around for many, many decades. And so people already knew these analog filter designs, and so they looked for a simple way to transform them. Um, so what we're going to look at here is we'll, we'll focus on the low-pass filter versions of these because we'll, we'll see that <clears throat> in the next set of notes we'll talk about how to take any low-pass filter and convert it into band pass, band stop, high pass, <clears throat> and things like that. Um, so really all you need to do is master the low-pass filter ideas. Uh, and like I already said, in, in reality, MATLAB has commands that will do the low-pass, band-pass, you know, all, all the different types um, for you. Um, but like I said, it's, it's uh, important to have at least some idea of, of what's going on underneath uh, the, the covers, so to speak. So we're going to look at four different uh, types of, of filters and, and we're going to be looking at the analog versions of those, so keep that in mind as we go through this. So, um, Butterworth filters, um, a name that always makes me hungry for pancakes. Uh, we've got Chebyshev filters, uh, named after a famous Russian mathematician. Uh, and we actually have two, two types of those. Uh, we've got elliptic filters, and we've got Bessel filters. So, you know, actually all of these are named after... Uh, well, th three out of the four are named after somebody, uh, and they all come out of theory, mathematical theory of various polynomials um, that was being developed uh, just in, in the pure mathematic world, and then people were able to use them <clears throat> to apply to analog filter design. So, you know, I've listed here some of the characteristics of each of these. So Butterworth filters are, are known for being what are known as maximally flat uh, designs, and in some way that's a desirable characteristic. That just means that um, even though the magnitude is monotonic, um, uh, so it doesn't have any ripples either in the pass band or the stop band, um, the uh, pass band kind of stays as flat as possible throughout, uh, all the way out to the cutoff frequency. That doesn't mean that it doesn't drop off at all, but it just drops off uh, slower than, than, um, than any other filters. Uh, Chebyshev uh, are equal ripple in the pass band or in the stop band, but not both. Um, so type 1 has equal ripple behavior in the pass band, but it's monotonic in the stop band. Type 2 is the opposite, monotonic in the pass band and equal ripple in the stop band. So we'll, we'll see some pictures in just a little bit that will uh, you know, nail down precisely what we're talking about. Um, elliptic filters are equal ripple in both pa pass band and stop band. Uh, and then Bessel filters, which uh, we will briefly mention, uh, they, they do have linear phase in the pass band. Um, they're not actually very good filters other than the fact that they have linear phase. 
Um, so they are also monotonic like the Butterworth filters, but they, they fall off much faster than the Butterworth filters. But they have that linear phase. But we don't really care about them that much because um, they have linear phase as the analog filters. Um, but as soon as we transform them over into discrete time using the bilinear transform, uh, they no longer have linear phase. So that linear phase is not preserved by the bilinear transform. So we'll start off talking about Butterworth filters. And uh, Butterworth filters have a very simple structure. Um, there's a whole class of them, obviously. So this is an nth order low pass Butterworth filter. So it's an all pole filter. Uh, notice we're talking about analog, so we're talking about the continuous time 4A transform here, superscript F, uh, with uh, the, the, the capital omega that I dislike um, in there as the, as the variable. So basically you can see that um, you know, this part here is just uh, capital omega raised, uh, raised to the 2n divided by some constant, which would be omega sub c raised to the 2n. So, um, so we, we do have a, a 2n order polynomial in the denominator um, for a magnitude squared, remember. And so um, when we look at that, um, if we think about how that factors out into the magnitude itself, um, we would get uh, you know, some more complicated polynomial. Uh, if we look at this, when we plug in omega sub c for omega, we'll get omega c over omega c. So we'd have 1 plus 1 to the 2n. Well, 1 to the 2n is still 1. So we'd have 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 over 2. And so omega c is the, the minus 3 dB um, frequency, or what is also known as the half power point. So if we rewrite this equation in terms of um, the Laplace transform and, and the s variable, uh, we get that the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform becomes h of s times h of minus s, and, and we get a structure that looks like this. And so now we can look for the poles. Now obviously, um, we're looking at this product, so some of the poles will belong to h of s, and some of the poles will belong to h of minus s. So the denominator polynomial set equal to zero describes that set of poles of h of s and h of minus s. And, uh, you know, the book goes through a little bit of, uh, of manipulation here to show how we go from this uh, requirement to, to this. But basically, we can see that we've got something in polar form here. Um, we've got a, a constant angle at pi over 2 with this part being uh, added to it as, as it goes around. Um, the, as we go through the, the k values. And we've got a magnitude out in front of omega sub c. So what this means is that the poles of this product um, are equally spaced in angle uh, at a radius of omega c. Now remember, this is all analog, so we're talking about on the s-plane. We're not looking for the unit circle here. Um, our frequency quote-unquote axis is not on the unit circle, it's the vertical imaginary axis. So if we go to the next page and look at the plot um, of this, so this is um, the real part of S, and this axis is the imaginary part. So, so the vertical axis is the J omega axis. Um, and so uh, the poles of H of S all lie over here for this case. This is for the N equal to 4 case. Um, and uh, uh, so we have, we have four poles on the left half side of the plane for h of s, and we have four poles over on the right half side of the plane for h of minus s. So since the poles for h of s are on the left half side, uh, we see that this is a stable um, function, stable filter, which is good. And uh, so this, this distance is capital omega c, um, and remember, this is not 
the uh, discrete time unit circle, and we're not talking about you know looking to see you know where these poles lie um, as we go around through the different discrete time frequencies. Nope, that's not what we're doing here. Um, what we're doing is we're looking at a J omega axis that describes our our frequency response or upon which the frequency response is plotted. Uh, down here we have the case for n equal to 5, and you can see that we now have 5 poles on the left, 5 poles on the right, um, and, and so on. So that shows how the poles lay out, and you know, really there's not any tremendous insight into that, uh, or from that, but nonetheless it's an interesting little uh, tidbit of information. Uh, and then we, if we look at the... Um, frequency response of this for different um, orders um, and what we've got here is uh, I think that that says omega sub e I don't know what omega sub e is but that's going to be omega sub c it's the minus 3 dB frequency and you can see that all of these have a value of of one half at that frequency um, and we'll be talking soon about this 1 over 1 plus epsilon value. Um, I mean, really, that I don't know why they show a horizontal line at that level, because we haven't really specified what epsilon is there. Um, but anyway, for different epsilon, we'll see uh, as we change that, that level will go up and down. Um, and when we let epsilon equal to 1, that horizontal line will be right here. Um, okay, uh, the big thing that we see here is that as the order increases, we get a sharper and sharper filter, which is, which is good. And, and, and we can see, you know, the nice flat characteristic of this um, throughout most of the passband. Obviously, it can't be flat all the way out to omega sub c, because that's where it goes down to, to a half. So how do we spec Butterworth filters? Let's just take a quick look at this. So all we really need to do, as we've just seen uh, this structure here, we really just need to say what order and what cutoff frequency. So where is the 3 dB frequency? As soon as we have those two numbers specced, we have everything there is to know about that filter. Um, but sometimes we like to spec in terms of other things. And um, so we can rewrite this in terms of a general passband edge frequency, omega sub p. Um, so maybe we don't want to spec it in terms of the frequency at which it's negative 3 dB, but of it being at some other level. So omega sub p um, is the frequency at which this response drops to 1 over 1 plus epsilon squared. So whatever that epsilon is, that's the value that gets plugged in there. So, um, so if we say, well, I, I want to look at the, the 3 dB point, um, I need this to be equal to a half, so I would pick epsilon equal to 1, then I put epsilon equal to 1 in there, and then WP stands for the 3 dB point. Um, I could pick something else, like a, a negative 1 dB point, uh, then I would have to find out what the inverse, you know, the, the non-dB value of, of 1 dB becomes, and, uh, well, minus 1 dB, and uh, set that equal to 1 over 1 plus epsilon squared, solve for epsilon squared, that's the epsilon that I would put in here, and um, then the, the corresponding omega sub p could be found, um, and, and we would spec the filter that way. So for a given omega sub p and epsilon, um, we can find whatever the attenuation level is, and uh, so we'll just call that, instead of using this cumbersome, um, well, I'm sorry, that's for w sub p, um, we can then spec a frequency omega sub s that hits some specified value delta sub 2 squared. So we've got a, um, a couple different things that we're talking about here. We've got uh, the omega sub p and the epsilon, which are telling us something about a passband frequency and the level at that passband frequency. 
and then we've got um, a stop band frequency omega sub s and the level that is achieved at the edge of that stop band. So we've got these four different things and if you put those things together um, we can um, get an estimate of what the order is. So the, the book defines and you know, we've defined what delta 2 is, what omega sub s and what omega sub c is. Um, we haven't defined what what delta is, so the book gives a little bit more detail on that. But the bottom line is, is uh, for a spec on passband, uh, uh, passband ripple, um, stop band ripple, um, and uh, um, passband cutoff and stop band cutoff, uh, we can figure out what order is needed to meet those uh, the, those specs. So we'll, we'll see how that works, at least from an operational point of view, when we start calling MATLAB functions here. Uh, so Chebyshev filters, as we said, there are two different types. So type 1 has the, the ripple in the pass band, and type 2 has the ripple in, in the stop band. Um, other than that, um, not much else to say about them on, on this slide. So type 1... Uh, Chebyshev low-pass filters are described by this structure, and type 2 are described by this structure. And so from this we can see that, uh, well, in, in both cases, capital T sub N are the so-called Chebyshev polynomials. Um, so if, if we look at this carefully, we can easily see that um, we'll the T sub n squared is going to give some poly polynomial in omega, and so therefore we, we can see that um, we'll only have poles um, for the type 1 filters. For the type 2 filters, however, uh, we've got... Um, a, that's just a constant. Then down here we've got a polynomial in 1 over the variable, and that's already in the denominator, which is in the denominator. So if you think about that carefully, you can kind of convince yourself that you're going to end up, if you simplify this thing, you'll end up with a polynomial on top and a polynomial uh, in the denominator. And so you end up having both poles and zeros. Um, and the epsilon uh, is a number that you adjust to set the amount of ripple that you want um, in, in the region that, that ripples. Uh, so just a, a passing comment about these Chebyshev polynomials. The, the classic way, most compact way of specking those is to use cosine and hy hyperbolic cosine. And you look at that and you go, wait, 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 wait. Polynomial? How is that a polynomial? Um, it works out that they are actually polynomials. Um, but an easier way to see that these are polynomials is, uh, you know, mathematicians, maybe even Chebyshev himself probably showed that these uh, polynomials could be found iteratively. So we spec t0 of x to be equal to 1, t1 is equal to x, and then from that point onward, so for k equal to 2 onward, um, we can get the next higher uh, order polynomial by... Um, combining the two uh, subsequently lower order polynomials. So 2x t sub k minus 1 minus t sub k minus 2. And so you can just keep working your way up that way to find out what these things are. Um, and so I, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but just as we saw for Butterworth Design, there's equations that relate the cutoff and the stop band frequencies and the ripple and the stop band attenuation. And, and that all gets linked to the order of the filter. And so you can use those equations to say, here, is, um, here are my specs, and then here is the order that I need in order to meet those specs. Now we have elliptic, also known as Kauer or Kauer <laughs> filters. Uh, I'll admit I've never heard anybody pronounce that. Um, I never had a, a course from a professor 
on analog filters, but I did a fair amount of reading about it when I was in college. Uh, so a lot of what I've learned, I've learned through reading, um, and unfortunately you don't learn how something is pronounced that way. But anyway, it's another one of those filters to find in terms of some sort of elliptic function, polynomial, um, and uh, um, so anyway, I'm not going to go into much detail on this, and, and again, there's equations that tell how to predict the order that you need in order to achieve a certain level. And then finally, we have Bessel, and uh, you know we won't really talk about these much more than just what's on this page. Um, so in this case, the, um, these are expressed in terms of h of s, not magnitude of h of s squared. Um, so a little different than all the previous cases. And there's a Bessel polynomial involved, whatever that is. Um, and this picture just shows... Um, compared to a Butterworth filter, uh, the magnitude response is, is horrible. Um, it starts dropping off almost immediately and does not stay flat. And remember, the Butterworth is a so-called maximally flat. Maximally flat response. But when we look down here, we see that the Butterworth free, uh, phase kind of curves it looks kind of straight, but it actually curves um, a, a little bit. Um, so, so we have that um, we have that issue to deal with. Um, but the uh, but the uh, Bessel filter just stays uh, nice, perfect linear uh, phase. So, um, but as I said, that that linear phase is destroyed by the bilinear transform. So. I, I introduce it here, but we're not really going to look at it anymore. So let's talk about how we use MATLAB to design all these things. Um, inside the each one of these commands is all the mathematics required um, to implement these things. So uh, that's why I'm saying you don't really need to, you know, be a master of of you know. Chebyshev polynomials, a lot of this is all built in, but you should at least have a feeling for how these things are specced and, and why they look the way that they look. So there's a command called buttord um, where you put in your passband cutoff, your stop band cutoff, the passband ripple, and the stop band ripple. So, you know, since Butterworth doesn't really have ripple in the passband, what you're really putting in is the uh, where it falls off to at this frequency w sub p. Um, same thing. We don't really have ripple in the stop band, but um, this is the value, the largest value that you would see at a frequency um, of uh, in, in anywhere in the stop band right out to the the stop band edge. So this. It, this command will calculate the minimum order and return it as this variable wn and it also or i'm sorry the the variable n and it will also um, return uh, the argument w sub n which um, is um, used um, to give the cutoff frequencies uh, to the actual filter design routine. So you run this uh, with your specs put in here. It returns something about the order and some characterization of the cutoff frequencies, which you then plug directly into the command butter, and you run that, and you get your B and A. So remember, B is the numerator polynomial, so you'll end up with a, you know, a B of S over a of s, where the b and the a vectors hold the coefficients of the b of s and the a of s. Um, ah, sorry, not s, z, because uh, we've now switched to, uh, to discrete time, so I, I should fix that here. Um, let's, let's erase that. Um, so I, I, I guess I won't even write that out explicitly. Um, remember, this is um, digital filter design. Um, so um, what we're getting is a digital filter. So this um, 
uses the classic analog filter inside together with the bilinear transform. So you don't have to do the bilinear transform on this. It's already done. All right, done. Here is an example of doing a Butterworth design. So um, I'm not going through the step of um, determining the necessary order and cutoff, but I'm just saying if you want a seventh order um, with a cutoff of 0.5. Now notice that we put in the normalized discrete time frequency here. Um, and so uh, when we plot our frequency uh, omega divided by pi, we go out to 1. So we're saying we want to cut off at 0.5. And you can see that we have achieved that. Um, and notice how it stays nice and flat and then rolls off. But notice how this part is bent uh, compared to what we were seeing for the analog Butterworth, that's because of the bilinear transform that's built into this. And the red line that I've put here is just, you know, kind of my hand fit linear uh, curve, you know, line, uh, so linear phase curve kind of hand fit to the upper part of the, uh, um, of the Butterworth phase just so that you can see kind of how it falls off um, all the way out to the passband. So at some of the higher frequencies of the passband, we start to see some significant nonlinear um, phase. And so what that means, remember, the linear phase filters mean that every frequency gets delayed by the same amount. So uh, when we have a nonlinear phase, some frequencies are getting delayed by different amounts. And so if, and, and this, this interpretation is important. This is why we like the linear phase. If you think about a signal that stayed completely inside the passband perfectly, I know you can't really get one, but let's just think about one that's almost completely inside the passband. Um, so its spectrum lies completely inside this passband. Um, and it doesn't, you know, even a little bit to the left of, of where the cutoff frequency is. Um, but enough out that we're starting to see some of the nonlinear characteristic. Um, that signal um, will experience, uh, each of its frequency components will, will not experience any significant amplitude change, but will all get shifted by, by differing amounts. Well, all those up to this point, uh, you know, up to, to about here, won't get shifted uh, at significantly different um, delays. But once we're out into this region, we're going to start seeing significantly different delays. So even though the amplitudes don't get changed, the phases are tweaked in a way that the um, each component is delayed a little bit, so they don't add up to exactly the same shape. So in things like communications and radar where you're putting pulses through, you'll see that with a nonlinear filter, um, it will impact the, um, the, the shape of the pulses, even if the, uh, the, the passband is, is beautiful uh, from a magnitude point of view. Okay, so that's uh, a little illustration of the Butterworth. Oh, and you can see where the poles and zeros fall. Now, this is on the Z-plane, um, and we're talking unit circle here. So this is going, you know, as we go from this um, zero out to one normalized frequency, we're going from this angle around to this angle. Um, so you can see all the zeros put there um, to push this thing down. And then you can see this row of poles that are, are perfectly placed there to, to keep this part pushed up and held as flat as possible. Okay, so worth design. Uh, Chebyshev design, we can do type 1, we can do type 2. I'm going to talk about the type 1 filters. Uh, we have similar commands for type 2. So you can just go to MATLAB website or go on to MATLAB itself and just type in help um, Chebyshev or you know it'll be Chebby2 and Cheb2 ord you can do help on those but uh, so we have Cheb1 ord so this is a 1 not an L so uh, Cheb1 ord will tell us 
um, will enable us to determine what is the right order for um, for designing uh, the the Chebyshev filter to meet a certain uh, set of specs. And so here are the specs. Uh, this is low pass design, so it's uh, WP is our pass band, WS is our stop band, R sub P is our um, pass band ripple, and R sub S is our stop band ripple. And remember, stop band ripple is the same as the amount of attenuation. Uh, so this will return the, the number N, which will be the order that we need, as well as a um, W sub P that will contain information about the cutoff frequencies. And then we put in um, these two numbers into um, here and here, and then we also put in the R sub P as well. Um, and that will give us the numerator and denominator coefficients for the discrete time. So this is a digital. It includes the um, bilinear transform in it. Um, and so that'll give us the, the transfer function coefficients for that filter. Here's an example. Uh, same order as before, just a, a, um, I'm, I'm setting my, uh, my stop band edge here at 0.7. Um, so that's, that's the way that you spec this. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't do the Cheb order, and here I'm actually doing Chebby 2, which is very, very similar. Um, so I would encourage you to just check the help on both Chebby 1 and Chebby 2 and, and see what the, the uh, similarities are. Um, and so you can again see that uh, unlike the Butterworth, well, we've got the, the, the pull zero plot over here. So unlike the Butterworth, not all the zeros are put right at z equal to minus 1. And notice that the, we still have a wall of poles, but they're, they're uh, backed off from the vertical axis um, just a little bit. And you can see that uh, uh, we, we still have some nonlinear um, phase uh, response going on. And since this is a type 2, we can see that it's flat in the passband and we have our equal ripple response in, in the stop band. And you can see that we did hit our our minus 60 dB um, requirement. So um, now we go on to ellipord, and this is the last of the IIR design commands that we'll look at. Like I said, there there is a command for Bessel F, but that designs only the analog Bessel uh, filter, uh, since you generally don't transform that over into the digital world. Um, so same kinds of things. We put in our specs here. It gives us um, things here. And then once we get the N, we put the, the N in here. We put the WP in there. We put the RP and the RS um, in here. Um, and we would design our, our, our filter that way. And so here is a design of that. And uh, again, seventh order. Uh, 0.5 is our... Um, is our passband edge. Uh, 0.1 is our passband ripple. So, you know, you can see that um, we can get a pretty fantastic magnitude response here um, with a small amount of computation. You know, you could compare this to trying to achieve these kinds of, of uh, specs with an FIR filter. You might require a hundred or more uh, taps. Here we've, we've only got you know, seven in the numerator, seven in the denominator. So it's an order of magnitude less computation, uh, which could be significant. Uh, we see a pole zero plot over here, and we see that the nonlinearity is even worse. Um, so um, as we've gone from Butterworth to Chebyshev to elliptical, we're seeing that the, the nonlinearity of the phase becomes worse and worse um, as we go. Um, and so anyway, um, very simple to design IIR filters uh, using these MATLAB commands, but it's important to understand what they do, where they come from, and why they work the way that they work. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a master of all these esoteric polynomials, um, 
but you should at least have an understanding of, of you know, what underlies the, the basics of, of these filters and, and what their different characteristics are. So we'll stop there, and uh, we have one more set of notes on IIR filters that we'll talk about transforming from low pass to high pass and band pass and band stop and things like that. Um, so I'll, I'll see you in the next note set.